I had to pick also a woman, and I tried to look for someone that made sense for this environment, and I went with Linda Hara, also known as Linda Poppy, and she was part of the LabVIEW 1.0 R&D team. And that, when LabVIEW 1.0 came out, they had this about picture that had the pictures of everyone in the team. And no, Brian was not there because he came in at 1.2, right? So you can see her, she's like on, the, on, the, on that picture, that was on the 25th anniversary, and she's the second from left to right, and that's her position also on the pictures there. She's the founder for G Systems, which is a big alliance partner in uh, Dallas, Texas. She founded that in 1990, and she's also the CEO for that company. She has 30 years of experience in test and measurement industry. She's an expert in design and development, so she actually knows uh, engineering and does engineering, and she knows a, one or two things about managing. So she has led G Systems from a software consulting firm to a full service integration company. And if you want to learn more about why we are doing this crazy thing about um, our giants are female, I put that bit.ly that will take you directly to the article that I wrote about this idea of talking about female, uh, successful women in engineering. All right, so what's the presentation? So um, the title that I had submitted was how do I get started with my DQMH project? I changed it a little bit to techniques for starting your DQMH based project. Uh, I added to the slide the DQMH framework batch there, uh, and I have some learning badges now. So if you go to ni.com, I think it's a slash badges, uh, Nancy, you can, you can take several badges. Now the idea of badges are not only to test how well you know a subject, but also a way to get you into investigating more about a subject. So if you don't pass the DQMH uh, batch at first, it, it is to encourage you to go and learn a little bit more. So even some of the DQMH experts that I know had to go and do it a couple of times. <laughs> okay. So this is, if you don't know about uh, Delacor, Delacor is a small consulting firm that I founded. It's uh, based in Austin, Texas. We help teams with software engineering process optimization, best practices training, implementation, software architecture, design and implementation. We also do hardware design consulting. We have customers worldwide, even though we're pretty small. We actually have customers in Australia, in different places in Europe, in Japan. Um, we also have a couple of products. There's the DQMH that you've heard already mentioned a couple of times this morning. Uh, we also did a locking amplifier for my Rio that's more for uh, students. And we have these other products that we don't have on the tools network, but we do sell to our customers directly. And, that, and they are based on the DQMH. We have a Delacor test sequencer. There's a version that uses the PTP sequencer and a version that doesn't. And then there's the Delacor configuration manager and the software engineering uh, tools. All right. So by the time we are back home, because I didn't have time to upload everything, the content of this presentation will be at this address. So right now it's gonna not, not going to work, but it should work by next week. All right. Uh, so the tool DQMH toolkit is free. If you want to learn more about videos about how to get started with DQMH, you can go to that bit.ly. The uh, documentation includes embedded videos. So as you go into the different sections, you can go to the videos. The newer version of DQMH 4.0 has on the block diagrams there are purple boxes around that have links to videos that have to do with those sections of the code. And as we are uh, creating new versions, we're adding more videos too. All right, so what is DQMH? Well, DQMH stands for the Delacor Q Message Handler, and most of you already know this joke. Woohoo! Um, it's access accessible to NI support. So Richard was asking me if DQMH was officially supported by NI. The DQMH is based on the NIQ message handler. So it is basic LabVIEW code. There's nothing in, in the code that you create, there's nothing hidden, everything is open. So any application team here can uh, support it. Actor Framework is officially supported by NI, but I'm not sure every AE can support it. So. <laughs> um, DQ 
ETMH is accessible to certified lobby developers, they shouldn't be, they should know what a queue is and what user events are. CLIDs can contribute to a DQMH project. It works with test stand, uses object-oriented programming, but does not require understanding it. It's, it's really curious to me that object-oriented programming was created to abstract code, and we're actually creating a framework that abstracts the abstracted code, <laughs> so people that are scared about object-oriented programming don't have to deal with it. Um, supports multiple instances, and we have tons of tools that help you with uh, user events. So how many people here know about DQMH? Okay, how many people are using it? All right, so almost the entire room knows about DQMH and about a quarter of a room using it. All right. Okay, it, it won the Live Tools Network product of the year. And one thing that we launched at uh, NI Week is a team of DQMH trusted advisors. So we realized that, of course, a small consulting company, there are uh, other larger companies that want to get started with DQMH, and they're like, hey, I don't want to start with something, and then what happens if Delacor goes away? Or what happens if this small company cannot help us? So we are working, we're uh, partnering up with Google Software Engineering. York is here somewhere. There is York and Manu. Um, there's a system automated solutions. Where is Sam is over there? Uh, Studio Bots with Matthias. And wiring software, they're in Australia, so they couldn't come. And test system solutions, they're based in New Jersey. Um, Hamburg, Campus Software Engineering is in Germany, right? Germany, uh, Denver, and Quebec in Canada. And the, the understanding here is as much as I think I could have a huge company, I really have no interest in managing a large company. We really like this, the work that we do, working with really difficult problems, helping teams get on their way. They want to have larger companies, and they are all interested in doing a lot more than what they're doing right now. So we want to empower them, and if you want to get into DQMH, and one of the reasons that you didn't want to get into it was because it's supported by a small company in Austin, well, we're starting to grow that. Okay, so what is it that I plan to talk about? So we're gonna talk about uh, how you plan a new DQMH-based project, how would you go about sharing DQMH modules, and how you build a DQMH-based application. And as usual, I have tons of material, and you already know, like, you know, it, it used to be easy to present in these places because I didn't know anybody. And now that I'm seeing a bunch of familiar faces, that actually makes it more difficult to me. Um, and as you know, when I start um, getting nervous, I start talking faster. So I'm trying to do my best as to not speeding it up. But there's a video, so whenever they post it, you can slow it down <laughs> somewhere in the bottom and pause me and everything. I think that's why we started with the videos for DQMH. It was a lot easier to pause me that way. All right, so let's start with planning a new DQMH-based project. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the continuous measurement and logging sample project that ships with Labby? Okay, not many of you. So when you go to the getting started, go to create project, you normally just go for the blank project. Well, there's another option there that's called sample projects. And, uh, and there's one there that's called the NIQMH Continuous Measurement and Logging Project Template. Now, if all you're doing is a quick acquire, analyze, present type of application where you wanna log the data to a file, all you need is this template. And really, if that's all you need, you can leave now. Um, go to the refreshments and stuff. If what you want is to reuse parts in another project, or you found difficult to split the NIQ message handler project, uh, is anybody using the Q message handler, just the plain national instruments Q message handler project? Over there, okay. Do you, have you ever had any problems splitting it into different people? Yeah? All right, so if that's a problem you're having, so, so just like that, and I'm talking to the guy at the top right corner of it. Um, Want to, if you want to learn more about DQMH or if you want to know how to get started with your DQMH project, then this presentation is for you. So let's just a little review since not all of you are familiar with what I was talking about. So if you go to getting started, select the continuous measurement and logging project. You can get the name there. It lets you uh, uh, edit the icon so you have a nice overlay. 
you click create, it normally doesn't create this fast. Then you go to the project, you have a main. What the main does is you run, you can um, say start, and you can have a sine wave, and it's logging. And you have a little settings editor that lets you select what type of waveform you're using and where you want to save it. So you can do sine wave, or you can do a square with noise. And then when you say okay, if you do a start, you get your square with noise as well. And uh, the other thing that, if, oh, if you go to the explore, let me see what am I showing there. Oh yeah, the log file. So it logs as a TDMS. So by default, just by creating the project like we just created, you have all that functionality already in there and it's all implemented using Q message handlers. All right, so I think what I'm showing there at the later on the video is uh, going to Excel and if you go to Excel, if you have the TDMS uh, plugin, you can select one of the TDMS files. You can see there that it's the square with Gaussian nodes. And if we were to go to the different worksheet, we would see the data types in there. Um, this is the Q message handler. It has the UI interaction, message handling, the acquisition loop, the login loop, and the display loop. And one of the, the problems or the challenges with this approach is that you have all your queues are in a cluster. And that cluster is basically shared around your application. So if you wanted to have someone working on the acquisition loop and a different person on your team working on the login loop, and all of a sudden you decided to add an extra module to your application, now you have to go tell them, hey, I'm going to be working on the code, you cannot touch it. So it makes it a little bit harder to, to distribute um, the effort. Any questions about this? So, okay, so let's start on how would you go around modeling the DQMH modules for your application. So, one suggestion is just you do a diagram. And I'm going to be showing you several tools. Some of them I use, some of them um, other people on my team use, and then some of the DQMH trusted advisors have shared their tools as well. So, like uh, Dr. Jespao was saying earlier, we tend to do more peer-to-peer -peer communication. Now we were discussing right at the, the presentation, at the presentation, you can also do tree communication. It's just up to the architect to design that. Um, but we definitely make it easier to do peer-to-peer. -peer. So what we're gonna be doing here is saying, okay, what I want is I want the DAC module to ask the setting ed uh, settings editor to update the settings. And then the setting, settings editor, I want it to notify, to broadcast to anyone on the application whenever the settings are changed. I also want to tell the user interface to start acquiring, uh, from the user interface, I want to tell the DAC module to start acquiring. And I want the DAC module to inform the user interface and the logger when the data has been updated. The user interface also will let the log file uh, know when to initialize the file. And I want the DAC and the log, log, the log modules to say when is it that they stop acquiring and when, this, when is it that they are done uh, with initialization and everything else. This clear? Very similar? All right. How many of you do this type of uh, drawings, boards, napkins? Do you keep it with your projects? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Right. Have you ever done that? Oh. And have you, because one of the questions that I have, definitely have, it's been talked about earlier, is really thinking carefully through in the DAC, where you're saying somebody's pressing a button on the DAC module, it says update settings. So an editor comes up, you update all the settings. And, but then you're also updating the log file with new settings. And so my question is thinking through, how do I know? Thank you. How do I know exactly and think through the process of what type of communication I'm going to need here and keeping in mind what kind of communication might I actually need in the future? Mm -hmm. So, and it's beyond the scope maybe of this presentation, but thinking through that challenge. Yeah, so, so the, in these, these plays, I'm, right now at this level, I'm just saying what are the messages that I want to send between the modules. Um, and just to clarify, the UI actually, we're not showing it here because I'm not showing the basic DQMH messages, but the UI tells the settings editor to show panel. So it is the UI that shows the panel. These update settings is when you initialize the module. The module knows that it needs some settings to start. Mm -hmm. 
and he's asking the settings editor what are the what are the settings. Yeah. So it's a it's a little bit different. But thank you for that question because yeah, that needed. Uh huh. Like talking about the peer-to-peer -peer thing. Uh -huh. This is all perfectly clear, and you certainly do it. But because you have a limited number of sorry, because you have a limited number of things, you can understand all this at once. Yeah, but if when you, you have, have fifteen three things, if you had fifteen things it would become hard to understand. That's why you need a tree. Well, when you do a tree, if you have a really large, uh, complicated application, it's still it's complicated. Any time that you are solving a complicated uh, problem, it's you problem. are going to have a comp need to have a diagram that makes it easier to understand. So you still need to have a tree, uh, a tree diagram. And you could still do with DQMH the tree yeah. calling. Yeah. Just like you could do this with Messenger Library. But the advantage of the tree is you, your tree has like a few branches which have sub-branches and sub-branches. Yeah, you could do it because yeah. the modules here, in this case the UI is launching the DAC and the log and the settings editor, but you could have the, lag, the DAC launch the logger, for example. So it, it is, it, you can make it work. Not, it's not definitely not encouraged um, or obligated. The only thing we really, really encourage you to do is to test your code. So if you're not maintaining those API testers, we have talked about adding my voice on the thing, just telling you, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, on the last slide, you had uh, a settings editor. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have one settings editor, or is there one uh, module? No, this one was one settings editor for the entire application. And how much does that settings editor know about the settings that it's holding in terms of the other modules? You'll, you'll see in a little bit, but it is, in, in this case, in because it's a very basic application, we are having the settings editor own the cluster that has all the information, and then it just sends the information for each one of the modules. On the Dell Core settings uh, editor, or configuration editor that we sell to our customers, we have it where the editor doesn't know anything, just knows uh, the uh, different modules register their page, their configuration page, and then the editor is more like the tools options in Labby. But we didn't want to get too complex in this project because we wanted to keep it simple for people that want to get started. So this is another tool that we use. This is the, uh, a, a table where you put your list your modules, your list your request events, your arguments, if it's a wait for reply or not. And uh, in this particular case, this is where you would start asking more of the questions that Nancy was asking is what type of communication do I need? So I am saying that the acquisition is going to have a request that's called a start acquiring, and it's also going to have a request that's called a stop acquiring. Now, should the start acquiring need a wait for reply? And the answer is yes, when you are doing modules communication, actor communication, you try to stay with the asynchronous. But there are certain actions that you need to know if they happened in order to continue with your application or not. So if you're working with a nuclear reactor, you want to make sure that all the safeties are in place before you start doing anything else. So in that particular case, uh, you do need a reply. So what we decided to do is acquisition does need a, uh, a reply. The reply is just the hardware ID. It could be anything. And then the broadcast uh, that is associated with the start acquiring is the acquisition started. So we have both a synchronous and an asynchronous communication in there. And then the other broadcast that the acquisition is going to have that's not related to anything is that the data was updated, right? Then the logger is going to have an initialized file and a stop login. The initialized file, again, is a wait for reply. What if, you know, I wasn't able to initialize the file? Maybe you gave me a directory that doesn't exist or there's corruption, there's no space. So you don't want to start logging until you actually get that reply. And then finally, the settings editor just has the request for update settings and the broadcast for settings updated. And I didn't update this, but I believe at the end on the continuous measurement login uh, example that we're doing with DQMH, that's going to be shipping with 4.1. We made the uh, update settings uh, a request and wait for reply. All right, any questions about this table? No? Anybody does something like this? No? This, again, when you start getting a lot more messages, uh, having other tools to discuss uh, uh, with your team can help. Uh, I will ask one, so when you do a request and wait, mm -hmm. do you tend to do a uh, broadcast as well? Is so that that's, that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, do we tend to do broadcast as well when we do a request and wait for a reply? We didn't used to, and then we realized that a lot of people, especially the, the programmers that are working with test end, 
test and it's all request and wait for reply. And you might be using your API tester as a sniffer. So if you forget to put the broadcast, the sniffer is not telling you that things happened. So DQMH 4.1, which is about to be released in the next few weeks, uh, cha we changed the round trip event. The round trip event used to only do request and broadcast. It now does a request and wait for reply and broadcast. And we modify the request and wait for reply to have an optional input that allows you to say whether you want to wait or not. So the round trip is actually now going to give you the three types of, uh, of events that we have in one sweep. So yes, the, the answer is, yeah, you should probably do that because others are waiting to know as well, are wanting to know as well. Um, sequence diagrams. So this is, a lot of people think about UML as only being class diagrams, but sequence diagrams are another type of uh, UML diagrams and allow you to look at the flow of actions. So we can say, for example, the UI is saying a start module. It tells the settings editor to start. The settings editor then says, okay, I did it. Then the UI tells the acquisition module to start. The acquisition module says I, I started. Then the UI tells the logger to start. The logger says I started. And then here is where it's the part of the settings, um, Nancy, where the acquisition is telling the settings editor update settings. And then the settings editor will rep reply with the settings updated for both the acquisition and the logger. I used uh, websequencediagrams.com to do this. Uh, there's a free and a paid version. And it's pretty cool because you can, you can also make it look as a nap a back of a napkin drawing type of deal. Uh, so anyway. And this is an, uh, another view. So the, fr the first one was just kind of like, what's the sequence to initialize the sequence? This one shows more when I am acquiring how does that look like? So I have the UI telling the start, uh, the logger to start logging. The, uh, the UI tells the acquisition to start acquiring. We get the broadcast with the acquisition started. And then the loop, which is gonna be happening continuously, is just the data updated going in, in both directions there. Okay, so are there any improvements? Did you notice anything smelly? Would you do something different? Ah, you didn't know there was gonna be a quiz. Okay, now everybody wake up. <laughs> <laughs> if you were at yeah, NI week, no, if, you, if you were at NI week, you're not allowed to answer because I had already mentioned this. You didn't know you had to do your homework before coming. So here's the thing. We are telling the DAC module to send the logger that the data updated. We also have a logger that only has two types of requests, the start login and the stop login. Seems like we need to have something else with that logger, right? If you're a logger, you should be having a way of saying log this data. So there was something missing there. We also had a note on our sequence diagram that said that the UI needed to wait for the acquisition module to initialize before starting the logging module. Because there was a dependency between those two modules. So, we created a dependency that's not really necessary. The logger module requires the acquisition module to be running before the logger module starts. So it can send that request, so it can register to that, that updated uh, broadcast from the DAC. What if I want the logger module for another application? That's not gonna be logging from an acquisition module, it's gonna be logging from, I don't know, maybe a simulated application. Um, so if you are planning on always using the DAC, the DAC module and your logger module together, then fine, it's okay to have circular dependencies or dependencies between each other. We do that on our configuration editor, we have a singleton, that's the <coughs> configuration editor framework, and then we have a clonable for our pages. And there are circular dependencies, those two modules have always need to be together. But that's okay, because I will never use that page in another application. Does that make sense? Questions? No? Okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is instead of having a data updated, which was a broadcast from the DAC that required the logger module to be registered to listen from the data acquisition module, we're gonna have instead a log data request. That means that now our logger seems like a more complete module. It's, all, it's public API has initialized file, stop login, and log data. 
that makes more sense. If I'm doing a logger, it should have a public API function to let it know that it needs to be logging data. That makes sense? All right. So this is, uh, this is what I tell when, when we are doing architectural reviews, I tell people, you need to, to see if it works in the spoken language when you're describing your models, it's going to be a lot easier to implement. If you're having trouble understanding on the spoken language from a model or from a table or from whatever tool you're using, it's going to be a pain to implement. So it doesn't have to be English, it can be French, whatever is it, but it's just a spoken language. All right, so the guys in Australia, were in software, came up with this table. One thing that we mentioned in the documentation, but it gets lost uh, with everything else on the videos and everything else, is that it's a good idea to name your broadcast events on past tense. So graph updated. And use imperative, even though it's a request and you're really not giving an order, use imperative for the request events. Update graph. This will help you also to like identify if you are do, using the right type of event type, uh, Nancy. The other thing that you need to do is identify circular dependencies. So it's okay if you plan to always use both the image module together, like we said before. So they came up with a little bit more complex table. This is what the table looks like. Do not get scared. We're going to go little by little, by little uh, over it. So we have the user interface module is going to be sending the uh, star acquiring, which is a request and wait for reply, to the acquisition module. And it's also going to be sending the stop acquiring, which is just a regular request, to the acquisition module. The acquisition module is going to be sending, it's going to have the uh, acquisition started broadcast, which is the red here, the data updated, and the acquisition stopped it. And the only module that's registered for that is the user interface. When we look at the um, combination of, the, of, of both of them, or what's the communication that's going between the user interface and the acquisition module, we can see that there's no circular dependencies. The UI is always sending requests to the acquisition module, and the acquisition module is sending broadcasts that the UI happens to be registered for. If we had kind of like a checker box there, we would know that there's a circular dependency. I hope I'm doing a good job of explaining their tool. <laughs> and then here's the logger, and, uh, and finally the settings editor. So again, it's a little bit more complex than the original table. They decided to do this because they were having trouble when they were doing their code reviews of making sure that everyone was on the same page. So when they had the different people working on different modules, this is how they, uh, they were able to, to be more successful on making sure that everybody understood what, the, what they were trying to do. And, and again, when we were doing this table that uh, we were reviewing the table, it was obvious to me that part of the confusion was the whole past tense and imperative. So we now make it, I, I guess we should put it there, request, and then put in between parentheses, make sure that it's an imperative, and a broadcast make it um, a past tense. Questions? And now these tools, the sequence diagram, the tables that I just showed you, they work also for Actor Framework, for any other uh, application that is done in modular fashion. It's not unique for the DQMH. You would change the names because you don't have requests uh, and, and broadcasts, but, uh, but the idea should work as well. If you want to see a demo working from scratch on creating a version using DQMH of the continuous measurement and logging example, um, we did a presentation at NI Week, and that's the link for that. And it shows, if you go to that link, it goes to a blog post, and it's going to show you step by step how we did that. And then there's going to be a new blog post with the content from today. So if you go to a new virtual folder and you add modules, and then you add a new virtual folder for testers, and then you go to Delacore, DQMH, a new DQMH module. This is the same thing that Richard showed. The only difference is that I created the, the modules and tester virtual folder. And what that's going to do is that it puts your uh, DQMH module under the modules and the tester under tester. So if you're going to be adding multiple modules, it organizes your code uh, for you. So that's, that's a tidbit that even I sometimes forget that we have that there. <laughs> So, but this, this video just shows like adding step by step. So you have to create the, the modules and test the folders first and then it just knows. Yeah, 
if you have, if you already have a virtual folder on your project that's called modules and a virtual folder that's called testers, it will put them there. So on Lithium Edge 4.1, that's coming out, like I said, in, if you are interested on the beta, let me know and I'll hook you up. I know people. Um, <laughs> So the, uh, the 4.1 is going to have the same thing where you're going to go getting started, create projects, sample projects, and we're going to have the continuous measurement and log yield DQMH. And because we love initials, it's going to be CML DQMH. So what's going to happen is you're going to cl click on create project, and we put it so it will show up right underneath the continuous measurement and login. If you go to sample projects, you have the continuous measurement and login with the NIQMH and then there's the CML DQMH or you can just go to the developer and you'll see it there. And when you create it, it's basically gonna create the, the, the project that we just discussed that has the UI, the acquisition, the logger and the settings editor. And uh, there they are. So all the modules are there and it looks very similar. We added some LEDs to show you if the different modules on your application are running or not and it has a test there. Um, it has everything, has, it has a build specification for an executable. So that's coming to a VIPM near you soon. All right, so the question that I get a lot is, uh, and we also have a forum at the ni.com and one of the questions that comes a lot is how do I share my DQMH modules? How do I work with different uh, people on the team? So one option is to do templates. So we're very nice at Delacor, and if you install DQMH and go to LabVIEW project template source Delacor, Delacor QMH, readme.txt, we actually tell you where we learn how to do our projects, um, and it's that page there. That, that shows you how to create your own project template. And you can even use ours as an example because all of that code is open. So you can see our, our source uh, data, our metadata, and how we did that. So you can create your own project template. So if you don't like, like one of the things that we get is the, the Delacore project template that ships with DQMH, the top level applications is state machine. We did it that way because we wanted to, um, to give you an option that, to show you that you didn't need to have all your code be DQMH. Any type of code can call DQMH. Where when you are with actor framework, it's, it's eventually everything becomes an actor, right? You can call, you can have regular code call actor framework, but it starts becoming infectious. So I haven't seen, <laughs> I haven't seen an application where they managed to just keep it at bay. It starts like, well, this should be an actor too. Yeah, this should be an actor too. And then everything becomes an actor. So we did the top level as a state machine. So if you don't like that and you wanted to do your own project, you can make the top level be a DQMH and then you start from that project template instead of the project template that, we, that ships with DQMH. Um, the DQMH project temple examples that we have out there, like I said, we have this configuration editor where the editor framework DQMH is a singleton and the page DQMH are clonables. We do have a file class. We have configuration template libraries. So if you need something where you need multiple libraries, classes, and you find yourself doing that for different projects, it's better to have a project template than do a save as. Because what happens when you do a save as is you finish the whole thing and then later on your customer A says, who's customer B, right? Because you forgot something and then all of a sudden a message says, uh, comes with their name. So you want to put that on a template. Uh, we have also the test sequencer. We have a sequencer that's a singleton. We have a logger that's a singleton and then we have a configuration framework that's very different. It's very similar to configuration editor but it's specific for the test sequencer. So anytime that we find a type of project that we're doing often, we create a project template. Anytime that we are uh, tempted to go and do a save us of a project that we did before, instead of doing the save us for the new project, we do the save us, clean up, generalize it, make it into a project template, and then use the project template for the next project, okay? And we build that into the cost of the new project. That, does that make sense? So that's how we know if you need it twice, there's a chance you're gonna need it three times. So instead of saying, oh, we'll do it next time, you do it now. And I see a lot of nuts, right? Yeah, how many of you have your list of, whenever I have time, we wanna make this, yeah. 
So how to do, uh, the other option is to do a DQMH module template. Now this one is for, for example, we have a serial DQMH, um, a serial manager. That's just a DQMH module that communicates with serial devices. That's just a simple DQMH library. It's on its own. That makes sense to do it as a template. So if you want to learn how to do that, you can go to delacore.com documentation and then um, there's, there's, a, there's a link there on how to add it. So some examples of module templates, there's a serial manager that I was mentioning, test sequencer, a logger, a database logger. We have one that, that connects to a database called CouchDB. I don't know if you've heard about it, but we were using that in enough projects that we created a DQMH module template for that CouchDB. Um, we have an ROI overlay module that lets you uh, do things like drawing on top of BIs. Uh, Hample software, again, Jorg, if you want, uh, he has the generic networking module and that's a template as well, right? So the, these are examples of things where you find you are using that module over and over, but it's not quite exactly the same for every project, then you can make it a template. Okay, the other, that's so option one was templates, project templates or DQMH module templates. The option two is to share as reusable code. So this is, an, uh, and one, one thing that's using sub repositories or sub modules, I think Steve, I don't know where Steve was it, but Steve has talked about uh, liking that better than doing, uh, uh, having dependencies all over your computer. So one way to do it is you have your different repositories with your, so, with your reusable code and you connect to it. So the top level project calls the other DQMH modules from their repositories. So the way you do this is, let's say you go to that and then you copy the address for that module. And then you go to the repository and say, I want to add it as a sub module. You give it, give it the address of the other repository and that's how you're adding it. So right now I'm adding it to the libraries repository. I'm adding the acquisition repository. So these, I'm using source three because I find that that's the easiest one to do it. Uh, and what that does, it creates that Git modules and you can show, you can see there all the different sub modules that I had. It has the names of the different sub modules where they're relative to my folder and also where their, um, their locations are. So once you're done, when you guys go to download this code, if you want to check it out, you're going to put it there and then you just go in the advance and say recurs to all the sub modules. And when you clone, you start seeing how it's calling the other repositories. So it's calling the libraries, it's calling the acquisition, it's calling the CML UI. And at the bottom there, you can see that it's giving you the exact address or <coughs> hashtag for the different versions of your repository. So at the end, you end with all the different folders with the code that's in those different repositories, okay? So that's, that's one way of doing it. You can do it with sub versions as well. Yeah, so externals. Externals are doing exactly Yeah, SVN externals, and if you are mercurial, I think they're called sub repositories, mm -hmm. so you can do it with mercurial too. Yeah. So the other option, and I'm not gonna have time to do this uh, demo, is to package using BI Package Manager. So the, the, the modules uh, from some modules are built into packages, <coughs> and instead of calling the source code directly, you're calling the package. The reason I like this one better than the previous version is you have a control on releasing the code. You have to go through, I'm assuming that once you built the BI package, you already did your VI analyzer, you already did your unit testing, you did all those testing. I, I don't have a risk of getting into code that was committed and pushed to, the, to the, that repository that's not ready for me to use. And it's a little bit harder to establish these are the versions that we consider released. So that's, it can be addressed by having branches and tags and other, or other ways, but it, it requires now your team up to come up with that. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. We find that we use sub modules when we want to occasionally push back code, mm -hmm. whereas when we are sure that this is something we release and we don't want to get changed from the project we're using it in, then we would not use it as a sub module, but rather copy the code there or release it. So okay, they're bringing the microphone. Can you say that again? Sorry. 
So what I just said is that uh, we find that if we want to push back code from a project occasionally, then we would go with a submodule mm -hmm. because it gives the opportunity of checking back the code. And if we're sure that it's just a reuse library that we do not want to be changed within the project, then we would not use the submodules. And then you would use packages. So if it's, yeah, if it's release code, then you would do packages, yeah. Um, the other option is to package your DQMH module as PPLs. And this is a plug for Matthias's presentation later today. He's gonna be showing, he, he might not have time to show this, that's why he was in this presentation, but I don't have time to show it either. Um, <laughs> so he, he has a good video, and we're gonna be putting it on the blog post. Uh, if you all of your DQMH modules are calling the same code, the DQMH uh, library code for the queue. So if you start having an application that has 50 modules, now you have 50 copies of that code each time you build your PPL. So what you wanna say is exclude that and instead build the DQMH code that's common to everything in its own PPL. But it's the same idea is you, you have your versions of your different modules and each one of your modules is its own DQMH. A way to know what needs to be built into its own PPL or into its own package is just open a blank project, add one of your files, go to the dependencies. And there I can see that the settings editor depends on the CML shared. So the CML shared is gonna be its own package or its own PPL. And then I need to go to the editor and tell it call now the package or call now the PPL instead of calling the source code. So this is something that up there that you're using in IQMH that you have a hard time splitting work. It becomes a lot easier to split the work with DQMH because you can have everyone working on their own DQMH module and then packaging it as a package or as a PPL and sharing it with you. All right, and then uh, API testers. So I have been already telling you that I love API testers. Uh, Richard mentioned that that's a really a strong thing about DQMH. It really puts on your face that you need to test. If you are not convinced yet, there's another use for API testers, and it's to use them as launchers of your application. So what we have here, I'm, uh, no, I'm not gonna have time for this one, but uh, the main thing is you have your, we are basically copying the, the entire code that we have on the tester. You could probably do it with the tester directly, but in this case, we wanted just to show it separately. So we are copying the entire code from the API tester, and what we're doing is creating a top-level BI that's gonna be launching our application. So for that, we need to make sure that we are actually starting the application at the beginning instead of waiting for the start module. And this is gonna provide a, a built-in debugger for our executable. So uh, we also need to make sure that we uh, stop the module, that we have some error debugging there. And we say instead of the tester, now we say that the main is the one that is uh, causing things. Because this is now gonna be the top level application, we need to exit LabVIEW when we're done. And then we have some notes there that on the latest version, thanks to Matthias's feedback, we're probably gonna change that. So that's why it's important to have beta testers before we put things out. Anyway, so when you build these, you build it as an executable. And what this means is when you run this application, you're gonna have all the benefits of the API tester as your top level BI. And you are able to see all the logger back there. Then once you're ready and you're done debugging, you just tell the VI to be transparent, to not show the front panel, and then you are good to go. You also need to make the VI to exit. Now it's the top level application, it will always exit. So you have to do that, all right? So, and then that, all that's gonna do is that when you run it, it's no longer gonna show. Okay, so, and we left their nodes for uh, people to put the run transparently at 100% and the tricks that everybody already knows about, so, okay. Yeah, this will go away with uh, Matthias's feedback. So Matthias's uh, feedback was, we, are, we already have a placeholder on the top level for uh, arguments. So we're gonna, st in, instead of that, use the argument. So when you go to the command prompt, you run the application dash dash debug, and that shows you the tester. All right, so that's the API tester second life. 
So like I said, the content of this application is going to be, the, this presentation is going to be there, and then the QMH 4.1 is coming out in the following weeks, and it's going to have the uh, continuous measurement and logging example as a project template. So you can see how to do an application, because the shipping example that we have with the um, temperature chamber is not so representative. It's good to show how to use the QMH by calling it by other code, or if we test them, but not so much as to how it works in a larger application. Thank you.